This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. The outline for my talk is the following. The first I'm going to talk about a classification of itching. It's sort of how doctors who see patients who itch categorize them, how we think about them. Because the first step in sort of understanding disease is putting diseases in groups and then classifying them in a way that you can make a diagnosis based on the patient's laboratory tests, physical findings, and their history. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit newer approaches or new ways to think about treating itch. And then I'm going to begin the discussion of chronic itching and the nervous system to just sort of from the patient side explain what's going on. And then Dr. Steinhoff will pick up from there and actually explain the science of the nervous system and the inflammatory system in the skin and how it results in us having itch. OK, so first question, is itch important? Well, it turns out about 2% of all the visits to dermatologists are for itching. That's 1 out of 50. And that doesn't count itchy disease, like hives and eczema. That's just itch. And if um, you talk to someone who has chronic itching, their quality of life is about the same as someone who's on hemodialysis. So they have a pretty uh, difficult time with a lot of activities. Quality of life is a way of measuring the impact of a disease on a person that's comparable from one disease to another. So you can do a quality of life analysis on a patient with disease A and compare it to disease B, and they're comparable. So this quality of life is important, and it's important for dermatologists because we don't have endpoints of our diseases where people have heart attacks, they have fatalities, like other specialties do. So we have to rely on the patient's perception of their disease and how the disease affects them. So dermatology and dermatologic science ends up being a very patient-centered practice. OK. The problem with treating itch is that we do not have any specific itch blockers. That's, that's actually our job uh, here at UCSF over the next decade to help find these. So we actually use drugs to treat itching that were made for other reasons. And they kind of happen to work sometimes, but often not well enough. So, so we're left with no really specific drugs to treat itching. None of them were made with itch pathways or the understanding of itch in mind. So um, we're really just piecing together things that we figure out happen to work. OK. I'm going to talk a little bit about how itch affects people psychologically. Um, and when we see patients with chronic itching, they come in with a sort of psychological profile where they're both desperate and helpless. So they're desperate because all the treatments that have been done before have failed. Um, patients often tell us that if we can't help them, they'll kill themselves because the itching is so tormenting. I've had one patient commit suicide from itching that I was unable to control. So. Um, so this, this is, these patients are incredibly desperate. It ruins their lives. And they're helpless because 
Doctors say, well, we don't have specific agents to treat you itch. We don't know why you itch. We don't know how you itch. And so they feel very helpless in this whole process. In addition, if you have chronic pain or some other kind of injury, people are very sympathetic to you. If you itch, people kind of go like, well, it's just itching, you know? And unless they themselves have had severe itching, they really don't appreciate the magnitude of suffering these patients have. So it's against this background that those of us who study this think about this. Okay, the other thing that happens when you itch is you don't sleep, right? And so then you don't sleep, and that creates a lot of the psychological consequences of, each, of itch. So you don't sleep, you don't feel good. Um, and then if you happen to have a child, say, who has eczema, and they don't sleep, well, guess what? If your kid doesn't sleep, you don't sleep. And in fact, a single child with eczema completely disrupts a household. Because if they don't sleep, mom and dad don't sleep, the other people don't sleep, it's really very, very difficult. So um, itching by a, a blocking sleep or preventing you from getting quality sleep um, really has a negative impact on the quality of your life. All right. Now, um, most patients who itch, as I said, don't get help from their significant support network. So most patients are told by their friends or their parents or their doctors, including dermatologists, well, just don't scratch. So um, to begin the visit with a patient with itching, I tell them to just tell the person who tells you not to scratch, OK, and you just don't breathe. It's, that's how impossible it is. When you have severe itching, telling someone not to scratch is like saying don't breathe. And, and so, this actually empowers the patient and begins a dialogue where we can help them uh, to improve their situation. Okay, now, everybody asks about stress. Well, does stress do this, does stress do that? And, and stress is an important player in itch, but it doesn't cause itch. So I think of it like a stereo. The, there's an on-off switch, and stress is not the on-off switch. But stress is the volume knob on the stereo. And it works because when the sense of itch comes up to your brain and you have stress created from your lack of sleep, from constant discomfort, your nervous system also reacts going down and enhances and modifies the way you respond to itch. It does two specific things. It dries out your skin. So under stress, your skin actually can't hold water as well, and that triggers itching. And then stress alters the response of your immune system to various things and tends to make your immune system more allergic. So allergies are worse, and many immune diseases that are allergic in basis itch. So that's why the itching is worse. And then if you don't sleep, of course, you're stressed. So stress plays a multiple roles in itching. Now, how does itch get sensed? Well, itch like pain is sensed in the target organ, so that's the skin. And then that's sent via the nervous system in the skin, which pick up this uh, itch stimulus. And that signal is sent up through the spinal cord. It goes through a place where the nerves sort of from the periphery meet the nerves that are gonna go up to the brain in this area called the dorsal root ganglia. This is like a big processing center. And Martin is going to talk about the dorsal root ganglia because it's a really important area in pain and itch theory. And then these signals are sent up to the brain, and they're sent to various areas, areas like the areas where your brain lights up when you eat a good chocolate bar, you know, areas of satisfaction. So like when you scratch, it's like very satisfying, which is not good because it keeps you scratching, right? Okay, so this is kind of a diagram, and, and Dr. Steinhoff will fill in and paint the picture of all this, but this is simply to say that down here in the skin, there are different kinds of receptors, some for histamine, some for other molecules in the skin. Those itch nerves pick those signals up, and they send them up, and they get processed there in that dorsal root ganglia, and then from there, they get projected up into the brain to various areas. Some of those areas are responsible to cause you to reach across and scratch the itchy spot, and others of them modulate the sense of itch. 
Okay, now I'm gonna go through a few cases and describe to you how a doctor would think about these patients with itching and how we've developed a classification system that allows us to divide itch into different categories so we can think about what causes it. So this is a woman who's had eczema her whole life. She got a new soap, supposedly mild. Now she's got a lot of rash and itching, mostly here in the crooks of her elbows and knees. Um, in the place where patients with eczema get their itching, here and here. Um, and you can see that despite the fact that her skin is really inflamed, she keeps scratching and keeps scratching and doesn't stop. So I would ask doctors, what's the most effective treatment for this kind of itching? And often patients are given antihistamines. They're given ointments to work. They, they say, well, stop using the soap. Or maybe they give some kind of SSRI or something for the stress and anxiety. And it turns out, the most effective treatment here is going to be to treat the rash. So this kind of rash, or this kind of itching, is what we call type 1 itching. So this is itching where there's disease on the skin. And the treatment for this, in this case, the patient has itching associated with an inflammatory disease, their eczema, and the management is to treat the rash, right? So you make the rash go away, the itching goes away. So if the patient has itching from eczema, treat the eczema. Now this seems incredibly simple but in fact is often not done. Patients come in and say, I itch a lot, and the doctors spend a lot of time giving them pills to antihistamines and things like that, and they really don't take care of their skin disease. So while it seems really simple, it's very basic and important. Okay, now this is a more complicated patient. Patient had hereditary polycystic kidney disease. They've lost their kidneys function, so they have chronic renal failure, they're on dialysis, and dialysis patients get a lot of bad itching. And when they itch, they scratch their skin in a very specific way that get, makes bumps with little warty centers. And we have a name for that disease. We call it Curley's disease. And I would ask the doctors, well, how do you treat this? Here's what it looks like. There's the peritoneal dialysis bag. And you see these uh, raised up bumps with a little horny center in there. And so a dermatologist should recognize that that patient has renal failure. So this is what we call type 2 itch. And this is itching where the skin is normal. So this patient has normal skin, but has a lot of itching due to their metabolic disease. So this is itch with what we call only secondary lesions. So they really don't have a rash there. All the rash they've got, they made by scratching. Um, and if you see a patient like this and you look on the center part of their back where they can't reach, it looks normal. And these are all the kinds of things that ca cause these kind of itches with no rash. But as Dr. Steinhoff will tell you, each of these causes of itch may be produced by a completely different mechanism. So now we have one type of itch, type 2 of the three types, many different causes, many of which will be due to different pathways. So this is not going to be an easy thing to completely sort apart. The way we treat this is um, we improve their dialysis. They tend to have dry skin. We treat that. We give them light therapy. And then we give them Neurontin, like is used for pain, is gabapentin. And in fact, that works really well. So we think there's an important neural component to the itch in these patients. And this is a gabapentin trial before and boop, the itch after the gabapentin. All right, now this is another patient who has liver disease and itching. And their treatment is naltrexone. Naltrexone's an opiate blocker. So in fact, in patients who have liver disease, abnormal opiate metabolism, your own morphine that your body makes to soothe your pain, is actually abnormal. And blocking that stops the itching in patients with liver disease. So if you have kidney failure versus liver failure, your itch is by a completely different mechanism, and your treatment is completely different. OK. So the way we deal with type 2 itch is we diagnose their underlying problem. And then we have to specifically pick agents that work for that underlying disease. So if they have kidney disease, we give them light and neuron. If they have liver failure, we give them opiate antagonists. If they happen to have a cancer that causes their itch, it turns out that paroxetine or Paxil works pretty well for that. So we have different ways to treat different kinds of itch of this type. This is the last type of patient we see. This is a 33-year-old man, 34-year-old man. He's had two years of itching in his genital area on his scrotum. And he's a martial arts instructor. And on exam, 
the scrotal skin is sort of just thick, and we use a word lichenified for that. It looks like lichen is all piled up. And when you biopsy it, it just shows that it's been rubbed and scratched. You really don't see any disease there. And so here's this area that he just rubbed and rubbed and rubbed, and the skin markings are more prominent. The skin is really thick, but when you biopsy it, there's no inflammation there at all. So this is type 3 itch, and we have a whole bunch of diseases that fit into this itch. Many of the cases of itching in the genital area are due to this cause. No primary lesion, and often the patients have a neurologic basis for the itching. So they have some kind of back injury or injury along their spine somewhere, and that abnormal nerve, when inflammation occurs in the skin, triggers a very heinous circuit of itch, scratch, itch, scratch that the patient can't break. And it results in a complication we call sensitization. So sensitization we're going to talk a little bit about because it's important. And sensitization occurs in two places. It occurs peripherally and centrally. And sensitization is that process by which a similar stimulus creates more and more and more severe itching. So your clothes rubbing you, normally you'd feel your clothes rubbing you. But in an area where you have eczema, your clothes rubbing you will generate horrible itching. So the nerves are sensitized. And it works in several different ways. The peripheral nerves get hypersensitive to stimuli, and they react abnormally to inflammatory mediators. So uh, the researchers in Dr. Steinhoff's group have shown that things that should be causing pain are causing itch. So patients who have eczema and scratch and scratch where they should be feeling pain, it just makes them feel more and more itching and they just keep scratching and scratching. And areas where the nerves are already irritated are very susceptible to getting um, this phenomenon of sensitization. In addition, remember that dorsal root ganglion we talked about? Once you have chronic itching, anatomic changes occur in the dorsal root ganglion. You actually hardwire the sense of itch into your spine. So it's kind of like the phantom limb, you know? You've got this ulcer on your leg, it hurts like crazy. So somebody says, okay, we'll cut your leg off. Cut your leg off, and it still hurts the same because the pain had moved from that ulcer up into your dorsal root ganglion here. It got centralized, and that happens with itching. And that's why managing itching is such a challenge because now you've got this central sensitization. So we have peripheral and central sensitization. So chronic itch is learned and it's anatomically fixed in the central nervous system, specifically in the dorsal root ganglia. So this is really one of the reasons that managing itch is so tough. Okay, so how do we treat this patient? Well, we try to stabilize his back. We tell him to get a new chair, maybe get some physical therapy, get some acupuncture. We give him some local anti-inflammatories, and we use things like lidocaine or capsaicin, which blocks uh, an itch signal, things to locally stop the nerves from overreacting. And we use oral agents like Neurontin, Pregabalin, that's Cymbalta, which you hear advertised for fibromyalgia on TV, that are normally used to treat neuropathic problems. And the patients do better with this. So we're treating that sensitization that's occurring back there in the dorsal root ganglia. Okay, so this is now what we talked about, group one itch, group two itch, group three itch, or if you want to think about it graphically, the skin interacting with the immune system, that's type one itch, itch on inflamed skin. S the skin nerve sensing something that triggers itching, that's the skin nerve axis, and then lastly, the nervous system and the immune system talking together making this chronic itch scratch. So that's our three groups of itch. We now have a large group of medicines we can use, opiate blockers, central agents, light therapy, agents that act on the nervous system. And you see antihistamines, which are what everybody uses all the time. They're a small group up here in the corner that we use. Dr. Steinhoff is going to go through and explain now the mediators and all the pathways here in the periphery that, are, that result in the sense of itch and how blockers can be designed to prevent this. So, we're going to try to find the signals from the immune system to the nervous system that cause itch. We're going to try to understand the molecules that bind to the nerves in the skin and trigger itch, sort of the itch receptor. 
and we're going to try to find the signaling molecules in the central nervous system that transmit the sensation of itch from the periphery up to the brain. So Dr. Steinhoff's lab has bit off this big chunk here to try to elucidate all these aspects so we can understand how itch in the periphery ends up being sensed in the brain. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Berger told you already about this patient which we see which feel very desperate because of uh, their itch and so you're going to ask one possibility is to ask when, how can I help this patient, which is of course very important. And you can also go into another perspective and, and ask, okay, uh, what brings this patient here? What kind of mechanisms are behind this itch so that we can understand this itch better and then treat each uh, subtype of itch better and more efficient? And this is currently the problem which we have, and which uh, Dr. already demonstrated that we currently have uh, poor understanding of the different subtypes of itch. But why is it important to talk about itch? Because um, we see very many uh, patients um, which suffer from itch, like chronic pain patients, and it uh, and has a huge impact on the quality of life in these patients. And um, it is still very difficult or difficult to treat. And uh, we have because we have a lack of understanding of the different path mechanisms why all these patients uh, develop chron uh, chronic pruritus. As you can see here, we see chronic pruritus in, in children as well as in elderly patients uh, because of exogenous trigger factors, but also systemic uh, like tumors, so cancers can develop into uh, chronic itch and uh, also on non-inflamed skin. This is a patient who just chronically scratches and, and develop the skin lesions because of the itching and uh, scratching vicious cycle without um, any primary skin disease, which we have here. And then I would also talk about that we can develop chronic itch because um, something happens with the nervous system inside uh, on the dorsal root ganglia in the spinal cord or in the central nervous system. For example, you can observe after a stroke um, patients can develop a chronic itch because a certain area in the central nervous system um, then um, is not functioning um, correctly and develops chronic itch. And uh, also systemic uh, diseases like liver or, um, or kidney uh, problems can develop into chronic itch. And you can also have a combination uh, of two or three factors, and that's why it's also important for the physician not only to look um, and to look more very carefully, because sometimes uh, also the itch can be due to two or three factors. And this video um, to demonstrate to you: um, this is a patient which is video monitoring during the night with atopic eczema. And here, I think you can, uh, by seeing this video, appreciate that. Um, similar to chronic pain, that chronic itch is a severe problem, and in the next morning that this patient suffers uh, from um, sleeplessness and lack of concentration at school um, and, and at work. So um, chronic itch is a severe problem for the quality of life in this patient, and we need desperately better therapies. First of all, um, as Dr. Berger also already demonstrated, is that we have uh, these three subtypes of itch, and this is very important to understand, and I would to give you a little bit of background uh, behind that. Uh, first of all, we have itch in, in the skin because of certain inflammation, allergies, etc., like in atopic eczema, which can develop already in, in children as well as in adults. And while 20 years ago it was, and in the textbook it was said that atopic eczema is a rarity, it's very, very rare, we see more and more also elderly patients be, be, uh, develop for first time in their life a toxic atopic eczema in adults. And this can lead to very severe forms like here um, into a generalized inflammation with uh, chronic itch and even lead uh, then because of the um, a vicious cycle of itching and scratching in, into infections. And that's why it's important to treat this chronic itch. But itch can also come from the inside, uh, for example, based on medications and due to so autoimmune diseases, uh, but also infections 
as I said, uh, renal problems, liver problems, and different kind of tumors can lead uh, to generalized forms of itch. And the, uh, what is very speci specific for the systemic itch is that it's more symmetric than uh, the uh, localized itch and more uh, generalized. And this gives you also a hint in the history taking uh, whether um, itch is more likely coming uh, from the inside or from the outside or based on inflammation. And uh, very important also in respect to localized itch is that this is a patient, for example, which only develops a localized itch uh, on, on the forearm or on the legs because of an impingement uh, problem after um, an accident. And a couple of years after this impingement and impairment uh, of uh, the function of the bone, which puts pressure on your, on your nerves in the spinal cord or in the dorsal root ganglia nerves, then can de uh, develop to, to an itch sensation in the skin. And then because of the uh, chronic rubbing and scratching, de um, you can see then uh, secondarily these, these skin lesions. So many factors um, like impingement and injury and also osteoporosis in the cervical area or spinal area can, can lead uh, to these kind of forms of neuropathic itch, how we call that. And um, in elderly patients, also very important to consider are uh, always um, stroke or CNS problems, for example. Strokes can lead to um, forms of, uh, of chronic itch in, in certain areas. Another problem for, with respect to chronic itches that we, um, that we uh, see is that um, some patients have a hypersensitive skin, whether it's genetic or by the environment, use of certain toxins. Um, um, they develop uh, this, what we call um, hyperkinesis, which is an aggerated itch sensation. So when you have um, something on it which is normally not itchy, but then um, becomes uh, very itchy. For example, bee sting for some patients, it's a, a two minute itch. For others, it, it lasts for hours or days. So um, we have different kinds of skin and uh, we develop uh, different responses uh, to the skin, to plants. Um, so uh, we have a different form of, of sensing this. And then we start to scratch and sometimes we start to scratch our skin off because um, Sometimes the itch, uh, there's itch relief when we go deep enough in order to, to suppress by, by scratching behavior. But there's also other forms which are important to know. Um, some patients have a certain sensitivity for itch, which so a wind blow or, um, or wool fiber on the skin uh, normally does not uh, induce any itching for us, but in some patients, uh, wool fibers or even a wind blow can be sufficient enough to induce a chronic itch cycle. Then you start to scratch um, and it starts and the next morning uh, you have developed your eczema. So this is uh, important I understand because this can be uh, also uh, is important to know in order to treat and to uh, prevent it. So the end uh, we have uh, also xerotic skin. So we know uh, during aging process we produce less lipids and then uh, the, uh, the, these kind of crackles, which uh, then can be developed, which are not always visible, but can produce uh, severe itching. So in order to, to understand this, we uh, first need to ask the question, um, why do we um, itch and why uh, do not all skin diseases um, itch? Because this is, these are all kinds of inflammation, diseases with inflammation. But uh, in these patients, we only seen one of 40 or 50 with rosacea, for they describe um, chronic itching. It's more a stinging, burning, or pain sensation, but less itch. So the question is, why does the nerve, some diseases, the nervous system uh, per, uh, accept um, pain or uh, stinging, burning, and not itch? In other diseases are 100% pruritic, such as atopic dermatitis, while in other diseases, which are also very chronic, uh, widely spread uh, inflammatory, uh, only a certain percentage um, experiences pruritus. So there must be differences in our, uh, in our skin and in, in the mediators which are released in during this inflammatory process. And we want to learn more about these mediators um, 
which are released in this area because then we can treat very specifically um, here the pain and, and the itch in this patient. Maybe we need different kinds of treatment for this patient and for this patient for itch. And um, itch is also important to know and to keep under control because in the topic dermatitis, for example, you can see here, appreciate that this patient scratched very severely his face because of the itch and then developed because of a viral infection and uh, uh, severe eczema, which is then um, more hard to treat. So it's important also in dermatology that we get this um, itch under control. So this uh, cartoon shows you an overview of all the levels uh, which are important in understanding pruritus. Namely, we have um, the skin, which is uh, a kind of a barrier for danger uh, signaling from the outside, like toxins, um, from microbes, um, you know, scabies, fungi, bacteria, from house dust mite allergens, uh, plants. So it keeps us uh, the skin under control. And then we have because we have the nerves here. Uh, in the skin, which then tell um, our central nervous system that there's some danger um, f uh, in the outside and that this, um, this skin has to do something about it. Maybe scratching to get rid of the parasite. So, um, and this um, nerve um, signals um, here to the dorsal root ganglia, which Dr. Berger already mentioned, which is a very tiny spot here, but very important because it's uh, the factory which produces uh, all, um, all the proteins which, um, which then um, respond to all the trigger factors of itch which can be released. We all know histamine as a trigger factor of itch, but I will show you that there are other, many other uh, mediators in the skin which can also uh, are as important as histamine and maybe future targets for therapy and explain why antihistamine, in many of the cases, uh, don't work. So uh, these kind of mediators are important, get, and they are uh, responded here in, in the dorsal root ganglia, and then transmitted to, to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord uh, brings the whole information into, the, into our brain and tells the brain, okay, there's something dangerous, itchy on the skin, so do something about it. And um, the problem is that we still have a very poor understanding of all the mediators, the receptors, and the circuits which are going on in, um, in the central nervous system. And even this is a, a, a practically a, a black box. We don't know very much about the mediators and circuits and receptors in, in the CNS. So first of all, what we have to appreciate is that uh, probably there, no, histamine is not the only itch mediator that, that we have to understand more about the other mediators and uh, the other pathway which are involved in itching. And then we can find new therapies. So this, um, this picture shows you um, the distribution of the nerve in, in the skin and you can see that it, up to the upper epidermis um, our, our skin is highly innervated, and these little green areas are the sensory nerves which stick into our skin and then give the information to the CNS, okay, there's something itchy uh, on our skin. Uh, so this is a picture of, of this kind of nerve ending which we have in our skin. And what we, and currently scientists all over the world are trying to figure out is what um, leads uh, to the itch in, in the skin and what kind of mediators transport the itch sensation to the brain in order to tell the brain to scratch. Because if we know all these mediators and receptors, then we can uh, treat uh, our patients better. So we know that uh, already in the skin, many cells can, can release itch mediators like keratinocytes, even uh, blood vessel cells and um, immune cells, and they activate certain receptors here on the nerve ending, and you can see in the nerve ending we don't have only the histamine receptor, but many, many different kind of receptors, um, 
and which can be activated, for example, by pH changes or by formalin, which is in many makeups, or in, and also, but also that can respond, uh, for example, to menthol, and that's why we use menthol as an antipyritic, because if this ion channel gets activated, it shuts down uh, our itch signal. So we have receptors which are propyritic, which enhance the itch, but also which can silence the itch. And also very interesting is that these uh, receptors here in the nerve endings are some kind of promiscuous because they can, uh, on the one hand, uh, they have been found because they can respond to touch and then lead to touch sensation and pain. But um, then uh, certain groups have found out that also certain medications can activate the same, these touch receptors, and then uh, induce itch. So a receptor which is originally Therefore, for touch in our skin does not, uh, can also mediate uh, itch if it's activated uh, by, a, by another mediator, uh, like a medication, for example. That explains why we have probably many uh, drug-induced eruptions and itching, because they can activate certain of these receptors, and there are only a few receptors which we have so far understood. And immu many immune cells in, in, uh, in the skin which are enhanced in atopic eczema and many of pruritic skin diseases um, can induce uh, many factors. And you can see um, that uh, that's, it's not only histamine, but many factors which can uh, lead to uh, the activation of a peripheral nerve ending. So this is, again, the skin, and then you can appreciate that um, during this kind of inflammation, you have a kind of a soup of different mediators, different cells. You have activated uh, epithelial cells, activated immune cells, and they all release some kind of mediators. And some of these mediators induce, uh, can induce pain, and some can, uh, can induce uh, the itch pathway. And so it's probably the combination of certain mediators which are activated uh, during this inflammatory process, which then activate either, then signals and tell, like in rosacea patients, that there's a painful stimulus, and in, in others, like atopic eczema, that there's, um, which leads then to an itch sensation. And we know from, uh, from our um, observations in, in the last years, because for example, morphine, when it's injected in, into the spinal cord, um, lead, leads to terrible itch. And you know all that morphine is a, is a, is a pain suppressor. So um, this uh, gives you a hint that um, the inhibition of pain uh, can, can intensify itch. So they are um, somehow connected. And I will show you that they are connected here in the spinal cord level, but it's not that as many people think that you have a small stimulus leads to itch and a large stimulus leads to pain. So they are more like twins, so each is an individual, they are somehow connected, but it's not uh, that the itch is a, uh, only the small brother of, of pain, um, and so each is individual. And a very important part um, in, in the whole itch process is that is uh, our brain. Because um, the stimulus comes to, um, to the central nervous system and from certain MRI and CT images, um, people have shown that, they, that um, histamine and other itch mediators um, can activate very specific um, areas in, in the central nervous system. First of all, of course, our motor um, cortex, which leads then to the scratching process. So you want to scratch when it's itchy, right? That's also what animals do. And, uh, but uh, also we have activation of certain other centers um, which are involved in the emotional or intensification of itch and also in the emotional part like suffering or also in, with respect uh, to compulsive scratching. And that explains that when uh, that, uh, patients also behave differently, that some patients are more depressive um, and in some in compulsive scratching, also there's activation of a, of a pleasure reward area um, where people say, okay, it's so great if I just scratch my skin off, it feels great. 
So there's because um, in certain parts of, of our brain that can um, lead to pleasureness of, of scratching, and that's why it's in these patients it's much more difficult to treat um, and to break this itch uh, scratch cycle. So the brain is a very important part um, in, in our um, itching process. And so far, we don't know really um, in which area, which mediator and which receptor is important. Um, nobody has shown that so far, in, neither in mice or in humans. And so this is still <laughs> a black box. We just know that certain drugs which we use, which Dr. Berger mentioned, that they probably work either in the spinal cord or in the brain. So uh, we all know that histamine is a classical mediator, and we uh, know, use histamine one receptors um, blockers, antihistamines, uh, to treat it. But uh, in the last few years, uh, very importantly, uh, they have uh, other histamine receptors have been cloned and described, and have been shown that they are also involved in itch. And this may explain why um, in, in certain diseases, uh, the antihistamines which you use, like Benadryl, are not sufficient or effective, because maybe histamine is important, but act here in this disease, the histamine 4 receptor is more important, or histamine 3 receptor, or a combination. So we are currently at the beginning of understanding, and uh, pharmaceutical companies are currently developing drugs and in clinical trials uh, also to block these other histamine pathways. And maybe one day uh, we have a better therapy by a combination of these um, receptor blockers. And I already have uh, told you that we have these kind of promiscuous receptors which are uh, normally respond to touch and, and then lead to pain. But the same receptors, when they are activated by medication, they can um, lead to itch and um, so they use um, a certain receptor, and w so far we have not uh, learned about all the mechanisms. This is the only receptor which we currently know, but here it's a little bit more easy because if you skip uh, the drug, then mostly the it resolves, as it's not the case in, in many of uh, other chronic itches. And what I will show you in the next few minutes is that a very important part in our understanding of pathophysiology of histamine-independent itch are, are proteases. And proteases make 5% of our whole genome, and so they're very abundant in from the brain um, to uh, in all organs, and, um, and the skin is uh, full of proteases, and also house dust mite allergens are partly proteases. Cowhage uh, um, has a lot of proteases, and even um, animals or bacteria, uh, fungi, use proteases in, in order to enter the skin and maybe pr uh, produce the itch. And there are certain receptors um, in our skin which can be activated uh, by these proteases. So um, from research, in order to make better therapies, we have to understand the pathomechanism, so how does that work? Um, so what we um, did in the last few years with respect to proteases in atopic dermatitis was that, um, for example, we use microdialysis. So this is kind of like acupuncture in the skin. So you put these uh, needles in, into the skin and then can measure concentration of, of certain mediators like histamine or proteases and measure the concentration in this disease and say, okay, in this disease, we have a high, high concentration of histamine. In the other disease, we have a high concentration of a protease. And therefore, here we need to use an antihistamine, and here we need to use an anti, uh, a protease inhibitor. So um, these kind of things give us a better understanding of, um, uh, but um, in order to develop new therapies. And interestingly, from the proteases, it was already described in Science and Nature in the 50s uh, by Arthur and Shelley that uh, using cowhage uh, and use the spicule of cowhage that proteases are very important itch mediators. But that has been very forgotten for a very long time. And um, then um, with years uh, here at UCSF, it was then uh, found that uh, there's a, a receptor defined as, as part two, which then may be activated by proteases and in 
involved in this itch process, and there are companies currently which um, develop an antagonists um, against this receptor in order to block this protease-induced itch. In order to, to understand um, the, how these proteases work and to develop these therapies, one part, um, important part in, in the research is uh, our cells, but also um, our mouse models, in which we knock out a certain gene, for example, of this PAR2 receptor, or overexpress this receptor in, in certain cells, like the nervous system or in epithelial cells. And um, so, and in a mouse which, uh, which overexpresses this recept protease receptor in, in the epidermis, in the keratinocytes, they develop spontaneously an atopic eczema uh, after six to eight weeks, um, showing here, and uh, they do develop also dry skin. Um, and they develop very severe skin lesions. So very, um, suffer very much from this chronic itch, and this mimics this kind of uh, chronic itch, so it's not pleasurable, but, but sometimes we need to use these kind of uh, methods in order to, to find uh, and to understand the mechanism and to find precise and optimized therapies. And here on, by, if you cut this into histology, and, and see that you can see that this is much thicker and inflamed as, as compared to normal skin and, and resembles atopic eczema. And this is just a few of the results which I want to show you. Um, here the black column shows that these animals scratch much more per hour um, as compared to the controls. So they develop a chronic uh, itch sensation um, and the question is why they do it and whether we can treat it. And one of the answers, which is very important also for our understanding currently of, of the itch process in the skin and what Dr. Berger mentioned as, as peripheral sensitization, is that these mice develop much more nerves um, in the skin um, and in the epidermis. So they develop what I said at the beginning, this hypersensitive skin, uh, which then a wind blow or fiber or a minimal stimulus can lead to chronic itching and, and scratching in these mice. And, um, and they, it's hard for them to get rid of. So, does it, so we use these animal models and it's, it's true in, in animals, but is it also true in, in humans? And, and we think, yes, uh, that proteases are also very important in in chronic itch like atopic eczema. Here's um, a, a protease defined uh, as prostasin, which you see in green here in atopic dermatitis patients. You, you can see this green um, that area of, of this protein, which is not in, uh, in, the, in normal uh, human beings, healthy humans. So, and also the receptor, which is in green, um, is not so much expressed in healthy skin, but severely expressed in, in atopic eczema. Think us that we have proteases and protease receptors which are upregulated and then can lead uh, to the aggravation of itch. And maybe in these patients, we need protease inhibitors or blocker for, for this protease receptor in order to treat uh, pruritus. So this cartoon uh, summarizes what we think about uh, histamine independent itch and protease are only one example. So we have protease from house dust mite, from bacteria, from toxin, fungi, and also released upon stimulation by, by epithelial cells. Then we have many immune cells in the skin which lead uh, to activation of, of certain receptors. Uh, and then we have the release of of growth factors for which then lead to nerve sprouting and then lead, leading to hypersensitive skin. So um, this is an example which shows you that there are many itch pathways and as I have shown you at the beginning that there are, um, there's not only one treatment for itch because we have these kind of uh, stimulators and uh, we not only have histamine and proteases but also in many inflammatory skin diseases, we have cytokines. Cytokines which are released by many immune cells. And in the last part, I want to show you that also the immune cells 
itself in inflammatory skin diseases uh, can produce itch. And um, this is a, a cytokine which we call, they are defined as interleukin 1, 2, 3. We now have 36 cytokines, this is interleukin 31. And, and interleukin 31 is interesting because in, in mice, when you overexpress interleukin 31, these mice develop spontaneously an atopic eczema, severe pruritus. And so the question is, um, is that important? And we think yes, because um, a couple of years ago, um, it has been shown in the, for the first time that also um, that a cytokine is involved in familial uh, related uh, chronic pruritus. So there are families who have uh, localized uh, pruritus. Um, and the question always was, why do, uh, in this family, do they have all, all family members um, this um, itch and, and scratch vicious cycle? Because they overexpress um, a certain receptor, which is called oncostatin M receptor. And this is part of the interleukin-31 receptor complex. And so this kind of cytokine receptor is the first um, receptor which has been demonstrated that if you um, overexpress, have much more of this receptor activated in your skin, that in these families, um, the, the patients develop a chronic eczema. So that tells us that this interleukin-31 cytokine may be important in, in the, uh, for uh, the development of chronic pruritus. And as in these uh, patients with atopic dermatitis, atopic eczema, we know, um, we ask the question whether this um, may be also important. This is a mouse study which shows you that if you inject interleukin-31 into, into mice that, you develop, that these mice develop a severe scratching behavior and also develop severe itch. And in these patients, if you take patients with atopic dermatitis or different chronic diseases and compare that to healthy skin, you can see that while in healthy skin, no, there's no interleukin-31 or interleukin-31 receptor, while in other diseases, uh, psoriasis, you have a little bit more of the receptor, but in atopic eczema, you have severe um, upregulation of interleukin-31 and its receptor. So this is an example of a cytokine which is probably involved in the development of a chronic itch in atopic eczema and in chronic uh, pruritic diseases. And also here in, in other chronic itch patients, this cytokine may be an important part. And as Dr. Berger has uh, already uh, elucidated is that um, these that the dorsal root ganglia and the spinal cord are important to talk to the, to the CNS and for the aggravation of itch, because if you upregulate in the dorsal ganglia or in the spinal cord these kind of itch mediators and the receptors, you can develop a chronic itch process and intractable itch, um, and so that you have activation in the skin but then aggravation in the spinal cord and then aggravation in the, in the brain, which then leads to the vicious cycle of itching and scratching. So uh, in the last slides, I just want to and emphasize what, what kind of mediators, what are the mediators which we know nowadays in, in these areas which could be uh, future targets for, for therapy. So we. Uh, know that, um, that there are certain uh, mediators like gastrin-releasing peptides, substance P, which are uh, here expressed, and here's a factory in, in the dorsal ganglia, which is then transported to, to the spinal cord and activate these receptors in, in the spinal cord accordingly. And if you have upregulated um, an upregulation of the mediators and or receptors, you have more severe itch. So understanding um, of the mediators and receptors which activates the peripheral nerve in the skin and then talk uh, to all this region is important uh, for our current development of, of future therapies. These um, sensory nerves which are in our skin are the itch nerves 
or itch receptors are only a part of, of the whole nerve which, which are in the skin. And so we have a part of histamine, we have other cytokine receptors and protease receptors. And so you can appreciate that when you activate with histamine, you activate the histamine pathway, or, but if you, histamine is not important in this disease, uh, then the histamine receptors are also not important and then you need to treat um, the other receptors. As you can see, only a small part of, of a whole nerve fiber is an itch fiber. Some are pain fibers, and, and it's interesting part is that only a small uh, number of these itch nerves, here for example, interleukin-31 is only 4% of all the itch uh, nerves, is sufficient enough in order to, to uh, transport and to activate a severe itch and scratching vicious cycle. Still, we don't know many of, of these mediators which are involved in chronic itching. So this uh, gives you an, a hint that um, when we have these patients which have acute atopic eczema, the need by vicious cycle of itching and scratching can also lead uh, to the chronification of itch because we have these different levels in the skin and the spinal cord and in the central nervous system which can aggravate this uh, vicious cycle of itching and scratching. And still we don't understand clearly uh, what uh, brings this um, patient to chronification and um, then to develop a better therapy. Um, some drugs I just want to show you um, and to emphasize why it's important that I have told you all this and get, went into to the nervous system and spinal cord and the brain is because um, many of the, the medications which we currently use and maybe also for, to use for your uh, chronic treatment of itch like naltrexone or gabapentin and pregabalin um, are uh, work here um, on this on these nerve um, in, in the spinal cord and, and therefore this is an important part to study also in the future to understand better um, the pathophysiology of itch. So why do we itch and why do we scratch? You know that scratching is like in pain, the pain withdrawal effect, so when you have fire you make a withdrawal effect uh, because it's painful. The scratching is also a response of, of our central nervous system um, to um, get rid of the itch. And um, so scratching helps because it activates certain nerve fibers and in the spinal cord these nerve uh, pain nerve fibers can suppress the itching. That's how it works that we can suppress uh, the itch by the scratch. The problem is that with the scratching, uh, we, uh, this is kind of a, can activate a vicious cycle, so then leads to more itching and then more scratching and then, so it's not a solution of a problem um, for the treatment of uh, chronic itch and many diseases. And um, when we, and all these molecules which I have shown to you is these are, um, there are many molecules in this area in the skin and here in the nervous system uh, which we currently study and uh, which are still not uh, completely understood and that's why it's important um, to study more um, itch in order to help you uh, to get rid of your itch. Thank you very much for your interest.